Greetings colleagues in the ACPE. My name is Jamie Beachy. I'm a certified educator and I'm here to talk with you for the next hour or so about transformative education and theory within the um, ACPE certification process. So my background is as an educator for 10 or so years and um, a student for a few years before that. I've worked mostly in Seattle, Washington, and also in Denver and Boulder, Colorado, where I am talking to you from my home above the mountains of Boulder, um, in the mountains of Boulder. And I would show you a view from here if it were still light out, but um, I'm speaking with you from about 8,500 feet above sea level. And I look forward to the next hour of um, dialogue, assuming that you're engaging in your own um, response to the conversation from wherever you are over the next hour or so. And one of my goals for this conversation is to embrace the awkwardness of the webinar, which um, is a little bit different than meeting in person and having the benefit of an in-person dialogue. So let's get started in talking about educational theory. So our goals for the next hour are to identify ACPE's mission and vision, just to orient ourselves to the conversation, to address the integration between the three theoretical dimensions of CPE supervision in order to um, talk about um, integration, which is a word that you've probably heard quite a bit in your process so far and may be tired of hearing, but it's an important uh, consideration in looking at educational theory. Thirdly, to explore methods for developing educational theory. How do we approach this and what are some strategies for that? And to identify major educational theories that influence the practice of CPE. So we will have a whirlwind tour through educational theory. So the mission of the ACPE is to positively affect people's lives by nurturing connections to the sacred through experiential education and spiritual care. And the words that stand out to me here are sacred, experiential, education and care. And that's what I hope to um, address as we move through this conversation together. The vision for the ACPE is to create measurable and appreciable improvement in spiritual health that transforms people and communities in the US and across the globe. And here there is uh, one particular word that stands out for me, which is transforms uh, people and communities. And the um, uh, transformational quality of education in the ACPE we will be uh, considering quite a bit as the uh, conversation moves along here. Okay, so integration and congruence. What do we mean by integration and congruence? Well, I have the uh, this picture of the Columbine flower, which is a um, beautiful flower that grows here, not too far from where I live. And um, the reason I have this, this flower as a metaphor for integration and congruence is what uh, we're looking for in the ACPE competency process, in my understanding, and I've been a reader for some time now um, of ACPE uh, position theory papers. And, um, what we're looking for is kind of a coherence of, um, of understanding and presentation and presence in the practice of education in, in the ACPE. And the flower represents this beautifully, I think, in that each of the petals is one of the dimensions of, of, um, of integration that we're considering. So there's the personal story, your personal history, your theology or spiritual and philosophical understanding, personality theory, educational theory, which we're considering in depth today, and the practice of supervision within the ACPE. And if each of these uh, forms kind of a pedal, and hopefully the 
flower comes together in a beautiful coherence. What you don't, what we don't want to see is a, a petal from different flowers, you know, coming together in some kind of like postmodern um, conglomeration. What what we're hoping for is a coherence and the beauty of that kind of coherence of presentation of your work. So one way of understanding um, integration has to do with critical purchase. And Benjamin Bloom's taxonomy, I think, is helpful here in thinking about critical purchase and what that means. Um, so Bloom's taxonomy is widely used in the uh, world of education. And if we think about it as a hierarchy or a, a way to think about the evolution of competence in a field, um, at the base level here, we have remembering, which includes skills like listing, naming, recalling, and telling. And then we move to the next level, which uh, Bloom names as understanding, which includes things like explaining and summarizing. So when someone you know, asks you what you do um, as a CEC or a student of um, supervisory education, um, you might have, you might be able to articulate that to the person in a coherent way, hopefully. And the next level we have is applying your knowledge to a particular context. So planning and organizing and developing strategies for um, education. Um, and what we're looking for in the theoretical uh, presentation of, of your work in the, in the integration paper is these levels of analyzing and evaluating. So comparing, contrasting, knowing the strengths and weaknesses of your, of your theoretical material, your theoretical approach to the work. Um, evaluating, being able to evaluate and critique your own work, critique um, the theories that you're using kind of assess whether an intervention was particularly helpful or not so helpful. And then at the highest level of Bloom's taxonomy, we have creating, which is, includes things like imagining, designing, inventing, maybe your own theoretical models, and modifying the theories that you're using. So that would be for Bloom the higher levels of, of thinking and um, learning. And so this model might be helpful for you in, in placing yourself in your own process and, and thinking, thinking through where you might be situated at the moment in your, own, um, in your own development. So next I'd like to talk about using metaphor to express integration. Before we go into, um, into educational theory in particular, I'd like to think about using metaphor to express integration. So my belief is that metaphor can be really helpful for um, bringing together those strands of theory and personal history and practice and vignettes and all of the um, pieces that you will need to draw together in an integrated presentation. Um, so this first metaphor that would be one example of um, sort of capturing what it is to do this work of education in the world of CPE. We could understand it as a contemplative journey, what we're doing in, um, in our work as educators. And these are supposedly the, um, the last footsteps that Gandhi took at the end of his life. And so I think this metaphor represents well the contemplative journey and could be a way to capture the work of, of CPE. The second photo that I have here, I've titled um, A Sacred Dance. And this comes from a student of mine who was a Sufi Muslim. And she wrote a lovely paper. I often had the uh, students there write papers about um, around a core metaphor representing the work of spiritual care for, for their own kind of identity development and spiritual formation. And she wrote a lovely paper about chaplain 
chaplaincy as a spiritual, a sacred spiritual dance. And she, um, she used this metaphor of the Sufi dancer. This next uh, metaphor that I want to just uh, bring into the conversation is the parable of the Good Samaritan. And this is one that is rooted deeply in my own Mennonite tradition, although this iconography is not very Mennonite. The uh, parable of the Good Samaritan is something that I um, identify really strongly with and has um, roots in kind of a, an ethos of justice and compassion. And so the Good Samaritan could be a metaphor to gather yourself around in presenting your theoretical um, approach to the work of education in CPE. And here again is another, another representation of um, transformative education in CPE. It could be understood as midwifery or assisting in the birthing of identity, spirituality, spiritual formation, um, pastoral identity in uh, the world of, of CPE learning and, and um, professional education. And so these are just some metaphors that are examples of ways to orient yourself around this um, task that you have of presenting your, your material and your, um, your theoretical orientation to this work of, um, of CPE. So this is a citation from my own uh, dissertation that I developed a few years ago in my PhD program at um, Iliff School of Theology and University of Denver. Um, I just put it up here so you would have something to look at while I'm talking to you about the metaphor that I developed in my own work. <clears throat> so if I were to, if I were to uh, present my own uh, integration paper at this point in my journey. Um, it would be, look very different than it did 10 years ago. Um, and that has something to do with the work that I did, that I did in my um, PhD program, where I really looked at spiritual care as creative interruption. That's the metaphor that I developed for my approach to um, education and theology and um, understanding of personality in, uh, in the work of, of CPE education. And the reason that I migrated toward creative interruption as a, as a way of understanding chaplaincy is I was really looking to explore this um, interruptive moment that happens um, when the care provider is faced with a very dis disruptive um, encounter with the care receiver, with the patient or student or client, um, staff member at the hospital, who presents maybe a radically different view of theology or a worldview that's really challenging or something that challenges uh, you know, the personhood of the chaplain. And for me, that moment feels very ethically important and very um, like an, a theologically engaging moment, transformative moment. And so I spent some time exploring that in my paper. And if I were to present on this at this point in my, in my career, on if I were to present an integration paper, I would... Cap try to capture this in 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 that um, in in that way as a um, as a theologically important and educationally important moment for both the care receiver and the care provider, um, and I'll talk about a little bit about that more as we as we move along. So I was often presented with people in my life who had radically different worldviews. And so there is a resonance with my personal history as well. I grew up with a lot of foster siblings and around a lot of cultural diversity and have um, 
kind of had a lifelong challenge of, of navigating that. And so um, if I were to, uh, sorry, this, I'm trying to get this to not be so prominent. I think it'll disappear after a while. So if I were to identify an educational theory that really works well with my um, overall kind of integrated approach to the work of CPE supervision, it would be most likely be the work of Jack Mesero and his transformative learning theory, which is the theory that's very prominent in the ACPE, but not the only learning theory by any means. Mesero is an American sociologist who um, taught at Columbia's, Columbia Teachers College, and um, his approach to learning has uh, really a focus on this disruptive um, moment that happens that leads to learning for folks. So one of the quotes that I drew out from his work is that people learn and change their views of the world through these disorienting dilemmas. And he believes that that is how learning happens. So you can see how Mesero's approach to learning would be resonant with my own um, development of my work as an ACP educator. I want to go through Mesero's stages of learning, and there are, I think there are 10, so it, I don't want to spend too much time on each of them, but I'd like to just touch on Mesero's theory as, as one um, example of a theory that I think works well with um, an ACPE orientation to, um, to education. So for Mesero, learning begins with a disorienting dilemma, and then there's a phase of self-examination with feelings of guilt and shame often associated with this. So there's um, kind of a disruption to the sense of self that happens. <clears throat> Thirdly, we have this critical assessment of assumptions. So the learner kind of looks at herself or himself and thinks maybe my, the assumptions that I've lived by in my life are no longer feeling as solid and as, um, as reliable as they once, they once seemed. Then there's a recognition that others have negotiated a similar change. And for Mesero, this is an important stage in successful uh, learning development that it's, it doesn't happen in isolation, but there's an understanding that there's the kind of a normalization of the learning. And the fifth stage for Mesero is exploration of options for new roles and actions. So there's a consideration of, of the possibility of doing things differently or being in a different way in the world that happens. The sixth stage is planning a course of action. So this could be in CPE, this could be learning goals or identifying um, objectives for to focus on in a, a learning contract and then acquiring this knowledge and the skills that are needed to move forward with the course of action and um, identifying what those that knowledge and skill base is and then uh, discovering ways to acquire those those skills there's a provisional trying of new roles, and I love this stage in his theory because it's um, very creative and um, leaves a lot of room for, as I, I've said about the webinar, about awkwardness and trying on something that may not necessarily fit. And for you all, it may be about um, exploring theories that, you know, trying them on for a time and seeing if they're resonant with and congruent with your overall approach to CPE and perhaps, you know, discarding some theories as not necessarily the, um, the best map for your, uh, for your presentation of your work. Um, but there's this kind of experimental phase. And then there's a building competence and self-competence through practice and through, through failure and through experiment experimenting and finally a reintegration of a new view of the world 
So this is um, for Mezzarel. Learning is really about integrating a new world view. So there's a depth to the way that he understands um, education and learning. And Mesereau is one of several constructivist learning theorists who consider that learning is an active constructive process. New information is linked to prior knowledge and mental representations are subjective. And so um, this is just a basic definition of constructivist learning theories, which I wanted to just touch on. And these are some classic constructivist learning theorists. Um, what I want to emphasize throughout, throughout this talk is that it's important to know the, the roots of your theorists. So some of these classic theorists, although Robert Keegan is a little bit more contemporary, but we, we want to, um, always be rooted in some of the um, lineages that you know that go back um, go back in time to some thoughtful um, considerations of, of education and theory but we also want to be in touch with the current and more contemporary conversation in the field which i'll be talking about more a little bit later but these are some of the classic theorists um, Piaget. Piaget's theory of cognitive development is a stage theory that explains how a child constructs a mental model of the world um, and basically conceives of um, learning as a development through stages, biological stages. Um, Lev Vygotsky is in many ways responding to Piaget and critiquing or contrasting Piaget's understanding of development. Vygotsky feels that social learning precedes development. So rather than focusing on the biological dimensions of, of development, he's more um, concerned with the social dimensions of um, development. And a quote that I drew out from his work that I appreciate is that every function in the child's development appears first between people and then inside the child. And so this um, emphasis on the social development is, um, is an important um, addition to the conversation around social learning theory. And then we have, um, Albert Bandura, who's a psychologist that posits that children learn through, um, again, socialization, but in particular through observing others. So his um, theory is a bit more contemporary and prominent in the field. Let's see, I also have included Robert Keegan, who has a constructive developmental stage theory. So he took um, the lead from Piaget in developing a stage theory of um, development, but for Keegan, the uh, stages have more to do with um, constructing meaning and constructing a um, sense of self in the world. And so um, Keegan is quite complex, and if you appreciate complex learning theories, you will appreciate Keegan. Um, he is very um, well regarded within the field of, um, of CPE. And Lawrence Kohlberg has a theory of stages of moral development. Um, he's also a psychologist and writes about, um, he's also building on the work of Piaget in developing a stage theory of moral development. So there's our whirlwind tour through constructivist learning theories. Now if we consider experiential learning theories, um, for experiential learning theory, knowledge is created through, this is Kolb's uh, definition, but through transforming experiences. So um, one of the most important theorists in this field of experiential learning would be William James, who's considered one of the fathers of pragmatism. William James is a philosopher who considers that a meaning of an idea is to be sought in its practical effects. So James is most concerned with um, the practical consequences of belief, as um, all of the pragmatists are, including John Dewey. Um, 
And John Dewey is another classic uh, educational theorist from the early 20th century, a contemporary of William James. And for Dewey, uh, his focus is really on experience as education. So a quote that I, that I drew out from his work is that education is not preparation for life, but education is life itself. So as you're doing your research on educational theory, um, one way to approach this would be to look at articles that are being written, um, you know, within the last few years, last five or 10 years on the work of John Dewey and how it's being reinterpreted if you're drawn to this experiential learning theory, or you can, you can do the same research for uh, William James and some of these others. Carl Rogers is a psychologist who's well known to many in the field of um, CPE education. And he's uh, writing a lot about the freedom to learn. For Rogers, um, he's very concerned about meaning and that um, learning involves the whole person of the learner and the meaning that they're making from, from their learning experience. And it's not just a um, mental kind of a process. And then David Kolb is a cognitive um, psychologist who writes, uh, also uh, draws from the idea of stages, but his stages are more dynamic and have to do with experiential learning. So I've here just captured Kolb's experiential learning cycle as an example of um, an experiential learning theory that you might be drawn to. And you can see that this could have some resonance within the field of, of um, CPE, where you know start with a concrete experience and then move to reflective observation. So this is similar to the action reflection model in CPE. And then there's an abstract conceptualization, learning from the experience and then experimenting with the um, learning that's taken place. So for cold, knowledge is created through a combination of grasping and transforming, as I said before. He's really um, one of the prominent, more contemporary theorists in regard to um, who's, who's thinking through experiential learning. All right, so Malcolm Knowles. Here we go on to the next landmark in our journey through um, transformative education. Malcolm Knowles is also a prominent theorist within the ACPE. Um, Knowles is writing, begins writing in the 1950s, but his theory has really um, continued to influence the field of CPE. He um, coined this term andragogy, or andragogy, which uh, exists in contrast in some ways to, to pedagogy. Um, Knowles, um, points out that pedagogy, the root uh, of the word pedagogy has to do with educating children or the, the um, education of, of younger people. And Malcolm Knowles is most, considered with an, most concerned with andragogy, which is adult education. And he believes that um, adults have particular needs as learners that he conceptualized in his work. And so these are the six assumptions of andragogy. And um, these are the considerations that one should take into consideration when um, developing education for adult learners. So the first one here is the need to know, the adults need to know. So they need to know, you know, um, what what the educational um, philosophy is that they're being engaged with. They need to know why they're learning what they're learning, that type of thing, because they're adult collaborative learners. The second uh, assumption in and andragogy has to do with the adult self-concept. So it's important to consider how learning will impact the self-concept of the learner in adult education. Thirdly, we have experience as foundation. So we already talked about experiential education, which I think is also important for children, but Malcolm Knowles is looking at experience as foundational for adults and their learning. And then their readiness to learn, you know, their um, kind of consent to learning, their openness to learning is really important to consider. 
and then the application and orientation of their learning. How will they apply what they've learned and take it out into the world and reorient their approach to um, their professional uh, identity or their way of being in the world, personal and professional. And then the inter internal motivation for learning is really important in Malcolm Knowles theory as well. Okay, let's take a deep breath and move on to some other theorists that um, are very influential in the field. I have to get my notes sorted out here. So we have Paolo Freire, um, who is a Brazilian theorist who writes on the pedagogy of the oppressed. Now, Freire is um, very influential in the field of education overall, especially for those concerned with justice and liberation and those qualities of education. So if you're not a Spanish reader, I will translate this for you. Although he's Brazilian, he's writing mostly in Spanish. Um, and this quote in English uh, reads as, education does not change the world, it changes the people who are going to change the world. So this concern with education as empowerment or also as disempowerment is important for Freire. He is exploring how oppression of one class by another is reproduced through the educational system. And um, as this mutual process between the oppressor and the oppressed. So as uh, another theorist that I'll speak about next is also concerned with um, education as empowerment or disempowerment. This is another paradigm for considering the process of learning and change and growth in education. And that's really just a very brief introduction to his work. I'm actually going to, uh, oh, we'll, we'll start with collaborative learning. We'll move on to collaborative learning here, which is a process of shared creation where two or more people come together to create a shared understanding of a concept, a discipline, or an area of practice that none could have come to on their own. So I really like this collaborative learning approach for lots of reasons. And one is that it's very communal. And in my own um, history, growing up in the Mennonite tradition, there's a strong appreciation for communal um, practice and communal experience. And this is also true in indigenous traditions. So collaborative learning is an approach to learning that is more congruent with an indigenous understanding of learning and, and education than some of these other models that we've looked at. Um, so collaborative learning is something that you might want to look into in your work, that this uh, wisdom or knowledge um, understanding emerges from the group as a whole, in a sense. And I think this is a beautiful uh, way of of conceiving of, of those moments in, in CPE learning where something happens that's greater than just the individual parts, that the group comes to a knowledge and understanding that they couldn't come to as individuals on their own. Okay, on our whirlwind tour, we're moving on to Bell Hooks here, who has a theory of engaged pedagogy. Bell Hooks is a contemporary feminist social theorist and she is known for her understanding of knowledge as not politically neutral, but connected to the will to know, connecting the will to know with the will to become. Um, she also talks about learning as the practice of freedom and a practice of, of growth and empowerment. And also very, in a very lovely way, she articulates learning as an act of love and that love is something that promotes our spiritual and our mental growth. So it's not kind of value neutral or um, disconnected with the um, uh, social, social dynamics and um, um, em empowerment and disempowerment that, that is present in our world. And so I want you to hear from her in her own voice so we're going to watch uh, two minutes of Bell Hooks in an interview where she's talking about her approach to um, 
to learning, which is a movement from pain to power. Hopefully this will work in our YouTube journey here into YouTube. I think I might have to give this a little bit of time to buffer so that her um, talk doesn't come across as kind of choppy. So we'll get this to load. This is a good, um, those of you that might be considering doing online CPE, this, there's some things perhaps you can learn from this webinar on the uh, kind of ebb and flow of using technology. Because if we continue to judge ourselves by the standards set within that imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy, then we never move. Because even if we move, but we still have what I call the voice of judgment. My theory is that the dominating culture depends on the voice of judgment. You know, that even when you're succeeding, you're not good enough. Even when, you know, I didn't think I was a writer, even after I had books published. Because, you know, for me, you know, what, what did I think a writer would be? What would be the magic moment that I could say, I'm a writer? And that whole thing had to do with my needing some type of validation outside myself to give me power um, and not to be able to think of, you know, power that I can give myself, that we can self-generate. Um, and I worry... And I talked a little bit, and we're not going to talk about Black Lives Matter tonight, but I was saying sometimes I worry because so many of our energies of protest and resistance are outer directed. You know, last night I asked the audience, what if we took away all the police brutality in our society against black males? Would black males still be, would black males be self-actualized? Is it really police brutality that is keeping black males from you know, I mean, I think about, I mentioned my brother last night, how my father used to say to him, glory, to me, glory, your brother ain't worth a nickel. And he loved putting my brother down. I mean, it's amazing that my brother could come out of addiction. You know, when I hear people like putting little black children and boys, especially you stupid, you dumb, uh, down, you think, how, how will that person empower themselves from that? How, do, how are we healing from that? And this particular conversation has to do with moving from pain to power. And that's really what we want to discuss about how, how do we, um, as people from oppressed and exploited groups, find our way to joy, find our way to emotional well-being, to healing. Okay, so there's a little bit of an introduction to bell hooks for you to pursue as um, as you like. If if the um, the work and the the uh, powerful influence that bell hooks is in the world is resonant with you, let's move on in our tour to a consideration of Parker Palmer a very different uh, theorist who also speaks about courage and empowerment. So Parker Palmer is a Quaker educator and founder of the Center for Courage and Renewal. A few uh, quotes that I really appreciate from Parker Palmer, and he is a, um, a living teacher who spoke at one of the ACPE conferences not long ago. Parker Palmer says that we teach who we are and that before I can tell my life what I want to do with it, I must listen to my life telling me who I am. So Parker Palmer focuses quite a bit on the person of the teacher and the courage to be a um, transformative presence in the world. And he has a lovely piece called, um, I believe it's called, oh, now I'm going to 
not represent it well, learning in circles, but he has a very communal approach as well to, to education and um, which comes from his Quaker orientation to, to learning and to um, spiritual formation. So Parker Palmer is another uh, really powerful influence in the field of CPE. And then we have, here we move on to Nell Noddings, another contemporary theorist. Nell Noddings is an American feminist. She's a philosopher of education and educational theory and focuses on the ethics of caring. She's teaching currently at Stanford, I believe in her 80s. And um, as I said, she's a philosopher who draws from the ethics of caring literature. And she um, really argues that caring is the basic reality of the human being and the human being's basic aim. And so she believes that caring is at the heart of any educational endeavor. Um, she believes that caring, that instilling care in others is best done through the experience of care, where the caring person is nurtured within caring relationships. And that um, the role of education really is to provide these kind of caring experiences. Um, and that caring relationships are themselves educative. <clears throat> so you can see how the work of Nell Noddings, as well as these other theorists that I've presented, has a great potential to um, inform the work and guide the work of, of CPE um, supervision. And I wish I had more time to talk about each of these folks and the profound quality of their work, but we're doing kind of a, a quick tour through the, through the territory of um, educational theory in the, in the world of CPE. Okay, so there are many other educational theories that I am not taking the time to, um, to capture here. There is Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences, or Daniel Goleman, who you might be familiar with, who also talks about um, emotional intelligence, and there's kinesthetic intelligence, these, uh, this idea that there's more than just cognitive or um, mental intelligence. Usher's theory of education and postmodernism, and uh, Robin Usher really tries to capture um, education in a postmodern context. If that's something that interests you, you might want to look into, into that, um, that work. Um, Yvonne Agazarian is a group process therapist who isn't uh, particularly um, explicitly talking about learning theories, but um, does spend a lot of time thinking about the group uh, as in the ways that the group evolves and the ways that groups learn together as a um, through a, a process that is uh, really um, intelligent and has a lot of potential to inform CPE um, education. And if you've looked at the webinar on education or on um, group process theory, you can learn more about the work of Ivan Agazarian. And then there's mindful education, the mindful education movement, which um, some of you who are coming from a Buddhist background might be interested in thinking about mindful education. Um, but there are so many theories to draw from and not enough time to really um, consider each of them. So how does one go about developing a position on educational theory? I'd like to just uh, throw out a few ideas that come mostly from my own experience and also from serving as a reader of uh, position papers over time. First of all, I would, uh, I would posit that it's, it's really important for you to know how to research uh, current the current conversation in regard to any of these theories um, and know how to do your independent research through Google Scholar or hospital databases the however you um, are able to access the latest research um, Google Scholar is something that's an open access uh, medium so I would like to uh, just spend a moment here um, looking at Google Scholar. So let's see, we need to go into Safari quickly here. 
And so if you go into your web browser and you just simply type in Google Scholar, you'll be sent to a search engine that um, accesses articles and a lot of uh, really helpful information in the world of scholarship. And so let's say that you're interested in Jack Miserow's work. You can tell I've already, I've already um, done this research in preparation for this talk. But if you're interested in Mesero and spirituality, Mesero, and you're thinking, well, what about Mesero and spiritual formation? Let's see what's being written about that. And um, one really important thing to consider as you're doing your research is this part of the search engine. So if you want to stay current, a lot of, of things that will come up might go back as far as, you know, his, the time that he was writing in the 90s or the two, early 2000s. This article is from 1997. So let's say that we want to know what's happening in the conversation since 2014. So you click on this part of the um, search engine and you see that a lot of really good articles come up. We have this article on connecting spiritual formation and adult learning theory in the Christian Education Journal, which for those of you with a Christian orientation might be helpful. And even those of you who have um, other traditions that you're drawing from, you might be interested in looking at that one. There is, um, let's see, oh, this one's interesting. A 10 year longitudinal study of effects of a multifaceted residency spiritual care curriculum. So this one is um, interesting. It's looking at medical residency, I believe, and um, professional formation. Um, here's one that's uh, looking at formation of spiritual directors, and this all is informed by the work of, of Mesereau. And so that's just one example of a search that you could do. Let's uh, go back to our presentation here. So uh, what does it look like to develop an educational theory? Again, research is really important. A red flag for those of us who are readers, or I can speak for myself anyway, is um, uh, receiving a paper that is really uh, rooted in theories that come from maybe the 1950s or the 1960s without any um, current engagement with the uh, conversation that's going on among um, people that have built on the theory, critiqued the theory, maybe um, added to... Um, reinterpreted the theory for our current context. It's so important to have some recent scholarship in your presentation of your work. A second um, important consideration in developing a position is to consult and to consult with within and outside of your center. So another a red flag that comes up sometimes or a challenge for some of the folks that are, that are developing uh, integration theory um, of, of supervision is that um, there's kind of an isolated quality to their work in that sometimes um, certain centers or maybe regions or um, um, what do you call them clusters can sometimes emphasize certain theories really prominently over others and that can really be limiting and so I would encourage you to consult really with the folks who are so have so much expertise in proximity to where you are, and then also seek out some voices that might um, be divergent from your um, the the uh, the theories and the perspectives of the center where you're training. Um, this one might be the hardest. This uh, this tip for developing a position on education, um, allowing the time it takes to integrate and develop congruence and critical purchase. And I would also add to this um, developing the vignettes that are very much um, rooted in, in a sophisticated understanding of theory. And so that just takes time. And then taking into account diverse cultural perspectives throughout the process. So know the critique of your theories well and have an understanding of how people that have very different views of, edu of your um, educational theories have, just have a, have a sense of what their conversation is like um, so that you're not kind of working in isolation and you're meeting those competencies for um, cultural humility and, and cultural awareness and, and uh, facility with cultural difference. 
So lastly, I would encourage you to be creative in your approach to educational theory, to have fun and to try new things and to um, be willing to fail and just um, allow the creative movement of this process to, to, to really open to that and be available to that. I think the most successful um, papers are the most creative, the, the, the most um, kind of um, inspired and maybe the fourth or fifth or sixth draft, you know, of, of your work is, is the, the incarnation that, that really represents you well. And so be present to those first drafts and those, those first, um, you know, attempts at capturing, capturing the, the passion that you have for your work and the love that you have for your students. So I have a reflection on creativity that I'd like to invite you to watch. And then I will follow that up with a closing reading from John O'Donohue um, as a kind of a blessing and a um, encouragement to you on your journey through this uh, very complicated and beautiful process. There are people who talk about the creative process with such humility. You know, there's a sense that something larger than yourself has worked its way through you. To paraphrase Khalil Gibran's notion about children, the creative process, creativity comes through you, but not from you. Though it is with you, it belongs not to you. Right? you know, this notion that we are the frontal lobes of the universe. And so when we craft beauty, when we vocalize, when we utter inspiration, what are we actually doing? Are we creating something that isn't there? Or are we merely transcribing, right? The notion of inspiration means we are breathing in and exhaling what we've taken in. So we're merely transcribing the observation of what is. We're recording. We are all cosmonauts, psychonauts. And the creative process is merely what we brought back as reporters of the numinous. When we go to Plato's realm of ideals, we are as navigators, we are as Dorothy going to Oz, seeing the world through a different lens, seeing reality through a different operating system, a different set of filters, and thus being able to read it different, to see something that others can't, and then bring that back, and then share that back. And I think that that's what's happening during creativity. I think that that's why we should be humble enough. Respect the gods. There's poetry in every moment. Okay, so creativity, to go back to my metaphor of creative interruption, for me, creativity is really at the heart of any um, transformative learning and is more than just a, um, more than just a cognitive kind of process, but is really a theological moment of evolution and um, kind of emerging from what was into what will become. And so I offer that to you as, um, as we come to the end of our whirlwind tour through educational theory, um, as an, hopefully a model of integration in that education and personality theory and um, spiritual and theological understanding should always kind of circle back around to the the other theories in a sense as the um, petals of a flower come together in the center of the flower to create a kind of a congruence and a unity. And for me, I'm um, learning as creativity is a, is a spiritual and a theological moment as well as a learning moment. So I want to leave you here with uh, a blessing from John O'Donohue as you, um, move through your process and through your 
your learning and your own evolution. And this comes from his book. To bless the space between us. This is a blessing for a new position. May your new work excite your heart and kindle in your mind a creativity to journey beyond the old limits of all that has become wearisome. May this work challenge you toward new frontiers that will emerge as you begin to approach them, calling forth from you the full force and depth of your undiscovered gifts. May the work fit the rhythms of your soul enabling you to draw from the invisible new ideas and a vision that will inspire. Remember to be kind to those who work for you. Endeavor to remain aware of the quiet world that lives behind each face. Be fair in your expectations, compassionate in your criticism, and may you have the grace of encouragement to awaken the gift in the other's heart building in them the confidence to follow the call of the gift. May you come to know that work which emerges from the mind of love that will have beauty and form. May this new work be worthy of the energy of your heart and the light of your thought. And may your work assume a proper space in your life instead of owning or using you. May it challenge and refine you, bringing you every day further into the wonder of your heart. Thank you so much for being with me for this hour. You can look for a um, handout, a bibliography, and some further resources on educational theory that will be posted with this PowerPoint. So thank you so much, and be well.